Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in the book of Jude. Keyword for Jude is contend because Jude wrote this letter to stir up Christians against the plague of false teaching and apostasy that had descended on the church and to exhort them to contend earnestly for the Christian faith handed down by the apostles. Jude, or Judas, was the half-brother of Jesus and full-brother of James, who wrote the letter, the epistle of James. Now, this would have been written after 2 Peter, but before Jerusalem was destroyed, so sometime between 68 and 70 AD. Dr. Brad Clausen's outline is excellent for the book of Jude, the call to contend, verses 1 through 4, the reason to contend, verses 5 through 16, the means of contending, 17 through 23, and the goal of contending, 24 and 25. Now, there's tremendous parallel between Jude and 2 Peter. Both letters have similar style and content and argumentation. Jude quotes, actually, from 2 Peter 3, 3 and verses 17 and 18, and Jude makes other references and arguments very similar to Peter's own. Jude also quotes from two non-canonical pseudepigraphical books, The Assumption of Moses, which he quotes them in verse 9, and First Enoch in verse 14. Now, those books were not breathed out by the Lord as Scripture was. They are not included in the biblical canon. The parts that Jude quotes from must have been true because now they're in Scripture. This does not make the rest of the Assumption of Moses, First Enoch, or the other non-canonical, pseudepigraphical, or apocryphal books true. The Holy Spirit breathed out the truth that we see in all of these verses, including that which was referenced from Assumption of Moses and First Enoch. So Assumption of Moses, First Enoch, not breathed out by the Holy Spirit. Jude, breathed out by the Holy Spirit, who ensured that we understood the reality of the statements made in verses 9 and 14. Very similar to how First uh, Maccabees is an apocryphal book. It is not breathed out by the Holy Spirit. However, there's historical data and facts, some in there, that are indeed true. And so it's important for us to remember Genesis through Revelation, those 66 books, that's the only canon the Holy Spirit breathed out through man. Well, verses 1 through 3, we see the command to biblical contention. Notice Jude's description of Christians in verse 1, which highlights God's work in drawing us, loving us, and keeping us. Notice also the emphasis on love that Jude expresses in verses 1 through the beginning of 3, helping us understand where he is coming from when writing this letter. This letter is very polemic. It's very confrontational towards all the false teachers infesting the early church, which fits, by the way, with what we see elsewhere in the Old and New Testaments in regards to false prophets and false teachers. So it's a helpful reminder that such confrontation must always be out of love. Love for God that his truth is upheld. Love for one another that we would not succumb to error and immorality. Notice Jude describes the sound theology expressed by the word of God, including the gospel of Jesus Christ, in verse 3. It's the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. That which was proclaimed by the apostles of Jesus and those under their oversight is what comprises the New Testament, which affirms the Old Testament. So the 66 books of the canon of Scripture represent the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints, to Christians. And it's a it's a perfect representation. It is all of the 66 books, no more, no less. The faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. There's no extra biblical philosophy, experience, supposed dreams, visions, or writing that's akin to God's word. Scripture is totally sufficient. No other communication is necessary for a person to receive eternal life and grow in godliness. It's the truth of God's word then that we are to contend for earnestly, beloved. Not to be contentious in character but rather to stand firm on the truth of Scripture and not budge, whether by attitude, thought, word, or deed. Verses 4 through 16, we see the reasons for biblical contention. False teachers do not merely attack from the outside. They worm their way within, creeping in unnoticed, whether by growing up within the church or quietly invading it from the outside. We're reminded of Paul's words to the elders at the church of Ephesus, Acts 20, 28 through 30. Be on guard for yourselves, first and foremost, and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Now notice the description of these false teachers that Jude gives. 
They were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Now, the Greek word here is from prographo, and it means written or proclaimed beforehand. Scripture is replete with warnings against false prophets and false teachers. Perhaps Jude is referring to some of the many areas in the Old Testament where false prophets are warned against. Perhaps he's referring to Jesus' warning against such in Matthew 7.15 and 24.11 as well as elsewhere, or to Peter's similar warnings in 2 Peter 2.1. Notice also the false teachers are described as ungodly persons, not worshipers of the one true God, though they may claim to be. Notice their corresponding immorality and actually rationalizing sinful living. That's licentiousness. And notice their denial of our master, our Lord Jesus the Christ, whether that's by word or deed. Then verses 5 through 8, Jude likens the false teachers to the wicked angels who possessed men so they could sleep with women, Genesis 6, and to the grossly immoral people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, the reference to strange flesh here is speaking to their homosexuality, as we see in Genesis 19. And if you'll recall, 2 Peter 2, 4 through 11, very, very similar to what we read here in Jude. Now, in verse 9, we see that Michael the archangel is brought up to help emphasize the pride that the false teachers have. Even Michael knew better than to think that he could control Satan, recognizing that only God had the power to rebuke him. Those who think they can rebuke demons and devils because they possess some higher power in and of themselves are gravely delusional. Only the Lord's power can rebuke demons. Verses 10 through 16, we see a continued description of the false teachers. They are revilers of that which they do not understand, like unreasoning animals, given over to sin like Cain, given over to error like Balaam, given over to rebellion like Korah, causing disaster in the assembly of the church, lacking fear of God, selfish, producing nothing good or worthwhile, shameful and yet unashamed, destined for destruction, grumblers, fault finders, given over to evil lusts, desires, evil desires. They're arrogant, they're flatterers, seeking personal advantage and gain. In a word, once again, they are ungodly. Enoch is now referenced as having apparently prophesied about God's judgment on such ungodly false teachers. And perhaps there we see that Jude was referencing back all the way to Enoch in speaking how these are individuals that were proclaimed or spoken about, written about before. Well, then we get to verses 17 through 23, how to biblically contend. We have to make sure that we're doing this in the right way so that God would be honored and for the sake of the souls of the others that we're interacting with, and to protect ourselves from giving over to false doctrine and immorality. So first, we have to be sure to submit ourselves to God's transforming means of grace. Study the Bible. Remember the words that the apostles of Christ spoke. Remember the Holy Scriptures. Cling to Scripture. Watch out for the false teachers. And pray in the Spirit. Pray according to Scripture, but with the Spirit's help so that we may gain wisdom from above, strength to resist false doctrine and sin, and submission to God's Word. We are also to biblically contend by growing in the love of God, remembering His love for us in Christ Jesus, and pursuing greater affection for the Lord with each passing day, which only comes when we study His perfections and works from Scripture and meditate on those wonderful truths. Let us obey God, obeying His commands. That's true active love for the Lord from the right motivation of the heart. We are to contend biblically by remembering Christ's imminent return to take Christians with them and allow us to enjoy eternal life with God and by applying discernment to ensure that we do all we can to urge men and women to repent from false doctrine and immorality while still keeping ourselves clean from being polluted by those who have gone astray. And in the goal of contending, verses 24 and 25, as we care for the souls of others, our goal is that we would stand firm now and when we stand before the Lord, that we be found blameless, faithful, being characterized by sound doctrine and moral holiness, filled with joy as we glorify our majestic and sovereign God forever. I'd encourage you to meditate on verses 17 through 23. When we engage with those who embrace false doctrine, may we love their souls enough to proclaim the truth to them, reminding them of the mercy of God, desiring that they would be saved. And may we have wisdom to know when we're casting pearls before swine so that we will not be taken down with them. Even then, we are to still pray for their salvation. Now, here's a good question for us to think about. Are you growing in the Word of God, thus growing in doctrinal discernment and moral purity? If not, you will be easy prey and perhaps go astray from the Lord. 
It's impossible to resist false doctrine if you do not find trust in Christ alone for salvation and then grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord through prayer, his word, and a sound local church. This has been the Letter by Jude, and I hope you have a great day.